Okay, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Tonight we're going to finish 14. Uh, we remember that the whole point of, of 1 Corinthians 14 is about regulations and communication of worship. And uh, so there's a lengthy discussion about speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues and prophesying. And what, what is happening is that the, the church at Corinth was being was divided over different sects or cliques within the church that uh, you know viewed one particular miracle as better than other miracles. And so there were those who thought you know tongue speaking was the best miracle and others thought that prophesying was the best miracle. And of course, Paul's point is is that the spirit that gives you these abilities is a unified spirit. <laughs> You know, uh, he wants you to be unified together. Uh, and, of course, you know, he begins the discussion all the way back in chapter 12 uh, when he starts talking about how they get the gifts that they're using is because of the gifts of the Spirit and so forth. And he says, for by one Spirit you're all baptized into one body. You know, there's a, a unity that should prevail in the church. And uh, unity does not just happen. Unity is something that we choose to do, uh, that, we, that we make the decision uh, to do things which foster or show or demonstrate or manifest the unity of the church. And so what they were doing was showing division, a divisive attitude. And so Paul is, is talking about the, uh, you know, we need to come together and identify, uh, uh, you know, this unity which Christ expects from us. So he says in verse 33, for God is not the God of confusion, but of peace. And so this was in reference to how the prophecies were using or were being used and how the tongues were being used. Uh, and the point is, is that, you know, we need, we need to learn and we need to be encouraged. Uh, and so God is not this God of confusion. Um, and so there's this picture that uh, uh, you can almost imagine uh, a, ch a church f or a house uh, filled. Um, now, it's, it's interesting because Paul in Romans chapter 16, I think it's about verse 23, might have been a little earlier in the chapter, but he commends Gaius, who is hosting the church in Corinth in his house. And so uh, a large house in first century, I mean, big home, you know, big home would hold about, 50 people. Okay, so when we think of the church at Corinth, we're not thinking of a church two or three hundred people. We're talking maybe 50 people. And they're all housed uh, under the house of Gaius, uh, that, you know, he's able to host them in their house. In other places, uh, they, you know, the, the homes are smaller and they can't host the entire church. But I think that's one of the reasons why Paul mentions, you know, the whole church that meets in his house. I mean, everyone in Corinth was able to meet in Gaius' house because, well, he was, he was uh, uh, an official in the city, uh, wealthy, most likely, and uh, uh, had a larger home. But everyone else, most other uh, Christians would have had an average home, which might have held between 15 to 20 if you packed them in tight. So uh, it's interesting when he writes to Rome, he writes to not the church at Rome. You ever notice that? He doesn't say to the church at Rome, but to the saints at Rome. And I think a large reason for that is as he's going through those that he's greeting, he's greeting those in the church in their home in chapter 15 or chapter 16 because there are more than one house, church, in Rome. But he is writing to all the Christians in Rome, not just one church in particular. Uh, but in Corinth, it's a little different. It's a larger church, uh, say probably 50, maybe if they're really packed in 60, but most people say about 40 to 50 people probably in the church at the time. Now imagine those people now dividing up over uh, some prophesying over here in this corner and some speaking in tongues over in this corner and some over here wondering what in the world's going on because they don't understand anything. Uh, they can't understand the prophecies because of all the commotion. And it's just a, it, it, it's like an assembled uh, cacophony of noise and sounds. And Paul says, remember, God is not the God of confusion. That's not what God wants. The, the service of the church is to be uh, learning and encouraging, which means we have to understand what's being spoken. 
So if you're speaking in tongues, uh, let there be an interpreter to, as well. He says, uh, he's the God of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. He says, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. So, as in all the churches of the saints, I believe here he's looking beyond Corinth. This is a, a common, uh, I would say universal truth, that the women should keep silent. Sigao, uh, to keep their mouth shut, as it says, uh, in the churches. And I think that the, the, remember that the word church, ecclesia, ecclesia uh, means uh, assembly. And uh, we often translate it church, but obviously when the Senate, when the Roman Senate would meet in their assembly, we wouldn't call that the church. We would call that an assembly. And so uh, we understand the word ecclesia uh, at its base meaning just means assembly, just like uh, angelos means messenger. Uh, and we usually translate it angel. But when we think of angels, we normally think of the heavenly beings, right? But not every instance of the word angel in the New Testament, or Old Testament for that matter, uh, is speaking about a heavenly being. Sometimes it's simply talking about a human being that has been sent with a message, hence he is an angel. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have to look at the context and let the context demand, uh, you know, its interpretation. And so in this context, Paul has been dealing with what? With the assembly, right? And so uh, the women should keep silent in the assembly. And some translations, by the way, do translate assembly instead of churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. As the law also says, if there is anything they desire to learn, let them uh, ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church, and it's interesting because uh, in uh, you know earlier in this letter, he's he's mentioned you know the the women who have a prophecy or the women who have a prayer, uh, and and when we dealt with that, I believe in chapter eleven, uh, the the point was that there are moments or instances when women can pray and can prophesy, and of course that would be in an assembly of all women. But when it's a mixed assembly, he says here that, that women are to keep silent, so much so that if they desire to learn anything, that the worship assembly is not the place for them to be asking those questions, but rather let them ask their husband at home. Uh, and for it's shameful for a woman to speak in the assembly. Uh, that doesn't fly well in mar modern society. Uh, with you know female empowerment and things like that, uh, but you know we, we we can't take the modern culture and say, well, see here, uh, and, you know Paul is writing at a time where the patriarchy is dominant, and therefore Paul is just reflecting the patriarchy. The problem with that is is uh, Paul says that this is you know this God who is not a God of confusion but a God of peace is the one who established this principle uh, for all the churches or all the assemblies of the saints. Uh, it is not culture. He's not relying on culture or custom uh, to make this statement. In 1 Timothy 2, he would say that, I, I will, that, that men should pray in, in every place with the lifting up of holy hands. And then in verse 9, he goes on to talk about, and women likewise of course, in that case, the likewise wasn't, uh, you know, likewise when women pray, you do these things, but rather, likewise, there is a commandment for women. There's a role for women to play, and there's a role for men to play. Now, what a lot of people who balk at the idea of, uh, you know, women keeping silent and so forth is, you know, they always, they always come back with, well, you know, women are of the same value as men. I don't know that that's actually ever been a question. <laughs> of course, they are as valuable as men. They are as desired by God as God desires any creature, right? 
Uh, there is no, he doesn't look at men and put a value here and, a, and look at women and a value here. Uh, this has nothing to do with inherent value of maleness or femaleness. This is simply the role which God has given. And, and God has always given roles to men and women, right? Uh, we could go back at least as far as the Garden of Eden, right? And at the Garden of Eden, uh, the design of humanity is that there is a biological role for men and a biological role for women, right? You know, at, at its very fundamental difference, uh, women give birth, men cannot. They have separate roles. Does that make the woman more or less valuable because she has a different role? No. Does it make the man more or less valuable because he has a separate role? No. There's an old saying about too many cooks in a kitchen, right? You know, <laughs> too many cooks in a kitchen. When, when there are too many people that have authority, then no one has authority. Nothing gets done. That's, that's the idea of too many cooks in a kitchen. So God established the family. A man and a woman. A man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 through 25 or so. One flesh. But it's because they have left their respective parentage, which, by the way, he's saying this about someone who has no parents you know, Adam and Eve, but he but shows that he's showing, he's not just talking about Adam and Eve in the garden, he's establishing an eternal principle. Man shall leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, the two shall become one flesh, they're joined together, and they were created specifically to complement with an E, although it never hurts to complement with an I also, but to complement one another. Uh, which is the idea of completion, right? Complement with an E, uh, you're talking about does it complete something? And yes, uh, humanity, maleness is completed in femaleness, and femaleness is completed with maleness. In other words, uh, for complete, <laughs> the idea of completion, uh, to complete and fulfill all his roles, man needs woman and woman needs man. Again, that doesn't speak to value. The idea that these uh, uh, terms or these ideas speak to value is a human-made construct and certainly not a God-made construct. In fact, he would say in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 28, there's neither male nor female. All are one in Christ Jesus. There God is speaking of value judgment of maleness and femaleness, and he's saying there's no difference in those values all are one in Christ Jesus. And in that same list, remember, is uh, bond nor free. Slave, slave or free, it doesn't matter. Their value is the same in Christ. Jew nor Gentile, doesn't matter. Their value is the same in Christ. Because in Christ, we're all made to be equal. I love that sentiment. But that doesn't take away from certain roles. And so there are certain roles that women play and certain roles that men play in the church, in the family, and they need to be respected. Otherwise, we turn what is supposed to be at peace into confusion. I think that's the lead up in verse 33. When he starts this discussion, it's a transition. I would say that phrase is a transition from the prophecy in tongues earlier to the dis discussion about women and men and roles of men and women. Uh, j it, just like if we prophesied and spoke in tongues in a cacophony of noise, we would be going against this God who is a, a, the author of peace and not confusion. The same happens when we open the doors uh, for women to speak in the assembly as well. Yes. Uh, in, I know that it's primarily Gentile in Constantine, but <clears throat> under the Judaism, their voices were separate, men and women. So this would have been a new thing to Jewish 
as you look at the tidal forces, there was very little, I mean, it seems to be more of an individual thing than a group thing. Is that fair to say? Uh, I mean, so it seems that this would have been a sort of a new thing that men and women were worshiping together. Uh, so there, there is debate on how much uh, men and women were allowed to worship together. So most of the synagogues reflect that men and women were in the synagogue assembly together. Uh, there were certain areas of the synagogue itself where uh, certain men would sit and another area where the women would sit, but they would be very much in a room like this. They might be segregated, but they were still together. Um, and, and, of course, the temple, you know, when we come to the temple, we talk about the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, uh, and then the, the court of the men, you know, that, that these were like concentric circles where you could get closer and closer to the temple, and the women were barred further out. Even now, uh, if you were to go to uh, Jerusalem, and they have, you know, what's famously called the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, um, and uh, there's a, a street uh, that is was built by Solomon the Great in, in around the... the 12th century, I think. I, I don't know that part of my history as well. Uh, but there's this street, and then it's actually, it comes, it doesn't come to an end. It's just been dug up at this point, and then it drops down probably about 20 feet, and there's another street. Well, this street is the first century street, and uh, right next to that area of the first century street, there's a little section of the wall that's the women's wall. <laughs> and then all the rest of the wall up here is the men's wall. And so, uh, you know, they, they continue to be segregated that way, uh, although technically the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women and the court of the men don't exist anymore because the temple doesn't exist anymore. Well, and they have women as priests, so they have a certain... Uh, but, I mean, I'm not talking today, but, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you can go in the old room Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how long that lasted? Yes, and and was it you know I mean when the, when they came for the assembly, uh, for the synagogue, was it always segregated or was there a time that they were together for a while? I mean it's it just some of that we don't know. Uh, some of that we're reading uh, from the rabbinic literature that comes after the church. There's no doubt, however, that the New Testament um, exalts women and the role of women higher than it had been previously among the Jews, especially among the Romans and the Greeks, uh, which were a very patriarchal society. The very fact that uh, women are mentioned in a lot of these places shows that. Uh, for example, uh, in, in Roman literature as well as Greek literature, it was very common uh, for the philosophers to have a section in their writing about uh, telling women how to behave or wives how to behave toward their husbands, children how to behave toward their, their fathers, uh, slaves how to behave toward their masters. And then we, we find in the New Testament there are several passages that talk about how women are to behave toward their husbands and how Slaves are to behave toward their masters, and how children are to behave toward their fathers. But what's, what's different about these, and they, they call them the Haustafel, the, the German word, the Haustafel, which is the household, household codes. Uh, and so these house codes uh, in the New Testament are different because they also include instructions for fathers, the master, and the husband. You see, the Greeks and the Romans, they, they didn't have that part because as the father, as the, as the master, as the husband, uh, you did whatever you wanted to do. There was no behavior expected of you. You were just you. And then all the codes were how the women were to behave, the children behave, and the slaves were to behave. And the New Testament comes along and says, wait a minute, uh, we also need to tell husbands how to behave and fathers how to behave and uh, masters how to behave. And, you know, each one has their role to play. And so by doing that, it's showing greater deference toward women than traditionally had been shown. Now, today, 
uh, we go back to the, the codes of the New Testament and the, the roles of women, and most people look at that and say, well, see how backward that is. And then we, we call it backward because in a move that is the height of arrogance, and I mean the height of arrogance, is that we take our common society today and we judge every culture throughout history based upon what we do. We must be doing it right. And therefore, anyone who d disagrees or does it differently than the way we do it must be wrong. That's arrogance. There are times in, our, in human history where uh, man fared better than what he does today. Man knew better than he does today. And we, we talked about uh, a passing reference to uh, the, the physical role of women and the physical role of men in childbirthing, right? And yet today it's anathema to say that only women can give birth to children. If you don't agree that men can give birth to children, you're the backward one. I mean, that's, I, I realize these are terms, uh, you know, we're, we're calling a rose by another name. Uh, is it still a rose, I guess, might be the argument, but still, uh, females, only females can give birth. No male can give birth. That's biological. Now, we can rename genders and do all the things that the society is doing, but in the end, only women, only females can give birth. That is a role God has given them. And I would say that that's a sacred role that God has given them. In fact, at the end of the discussion of 2 Timothy 2 that we mentioned earlier, in verse 15, she shall be saved in childbearing. The idea that there's a sacred nature to that. Not to mean that a woman that doesn't have children can't be saved, but that she is fulfilling a role which God has given to her. Because obviously some women are barren and cannot have children. We see that throughout the Bible, different ones. We see that even today. And there are some women who choose not to have children. There are some women who don't get married <laughs> and therefore couldn't have children because they couldn't, legally be, in, engage in intercourse to have children. Ron? Just a quick question. I know women and wives are often translated from the same word. And some would say in verse 35, if they would learn anything, let them ask their husbands. And the argument is made, this is just wives. So from their way of thinking, if it was a single woman, she could be yeah, I don't, I don't think Paul is opening the door for that. Paul is setting forth the general rule of women keeping silent in the church. Uh, but we have to understand this is mitigated, right? Because women teach in mixed assemblies, right? Teaching one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, right? Right. Uh, is our song service, or the songs that we sing, uh, is there a didactic element to them or a teaching element to them? Absolutely. Well, since that's teaching, should a woman teach or keep silent? Well, we would look at that and, and I mean, I guess there's some that might go to the extreme and say, well, then women shouldn't be singing in church either. I don't think that's a very good one because what happens when you've got a, a woman who responds to the gospel and she wants to be baptized and the first thing we ask her is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Son of the living God? And she's got to remain silent so she can't answer? With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 9 and 10. No, we would say she can speak in, in, in the assembly. So we, we have to look at this you know, you know, through that lens. 
What is he talking about? He's talking about women prophesying or speaking in tongues in this mixed assembly and that they should respect the authority that God has put in men. Uh, that's the, you know, be, be in submission uh, because why? The law says so if there's anything, or I thought it said authority here. Did I miss that? Subjection. Subjection, is that, that's the only one, the submission, submission or subjection there. Uh, because it's not for, she should be in subjection. Uh, and so there's authority. Of course, uh, you know, the, the, I, I don't think, and I, I think you would agree, Ron, that, that, that women that don't have husbands can therefore speak up because they don't have a husband. I, I don't think that that's what Paul is doing. Again, remember, all of this is still in Paul regulating the assembly that it's not a, a moment of chaos. And, you know, tongue speakers should be silent, by the way. You know, it's not like he's only told women, you're the only ones that need to be silent. In the same context, he's already told those who, have, uh, who speak in tongues that if there's not someone to interpret, what do you do? You sit down and be quiet. You be silent. And so this is uh, simply the, the regulation that goes into that. Um, or was it from you that the word of God came? Or, you, or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual... He should acknowledge the things that I am writing to you, that they are a commandment of the Lord. Paul says, I'm, I'm not making this stuff up here. <laughs> if you think yourself to be a prophet or spiritual in any way, and the prophet here goes right back to those who are prophesying, let him take knowledge of the things that I'm writing. Let him understand that what I'm writing is the commandment of God. In other words, what Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians and I would say by application in Romans and 2 Corinthians and all the other books, is as binding and authoritative as the words of Jesus. I know we, we uh, a lot of us carry a Bible with what's called a red letter edition, right? The words of Jesus or the words of God are written in red. And what that does is it makes a lot of people think, well, these words are the most important words. That's why they're in red. Paul says, the things I'm writing to you, they're just like the red letters. They're just like the red letters. Why? Because he is inspired of the Spirit just as Jesus promised, right? He said, after my departure, the, the Spirit is going to come, He's promising this to his apostles. And he says, he will, he will bring to your remembrance all things that I've taught you. Right? He will guide you into all truth. John 14, John 16. Paul is an apostle who comes a little later. We'll see that in chapter 15. But Paul as an apostle has that same endowment of the Holy Spirit that brings to remembrance and guides him into all truth. Because Jesus says the Spirit does not speak of his own. But where does the Spirit get his information? From Jesus. Jesus says, I don't speak of my own. Where does he get his information? From the Father. So the Father to the Son to the Spirit to the apostles. It's a, a chain of succession that cannot be broken. And that's the whole point of inspiration. Is that it guarantees when Paul writes these things. They are the command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, then he is not recognized. If you don't recognize Paul's authority as an apostle, Paul's authority to speak the commandment of the Lord, then you will not be recognized. What do you, mean, what do you think he means by you're not going to be recognized? Recognized as what? To what? Mm, yeah, sort of. I think the recognition here comes from God, though. If you're not going to recognize these things, then God will not recognize them. And that recognition would be recognizing them as faithful children of God. If you're not going to follow what I'm telling you, then you would not be faithful, is the idea. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. 
Why? Both are for the edifying of the church. Both come from the same spirit. Don't divide over these things. Desire all these things. And by the way, I think the idea here is that earnestly desire and do not forbid is coming uh, command to the church, not, not to individuals necessarily, but to the collective. Desire prophesying. Why? Because that's what gives you learning and edification. And don't forbid tongue speaking because it's also good for you. But all things should be done decently and in order. And so that, I think verse 40 harkens back to verse 33, that idea that God has uh, given us an order, decently in order services. All right, any other questions? Oh, we, we didn't get into a, a long, drawn-out discussion of, of the role of women per se, although we did touch on, I, I think, some important highlights in it. Um, but... Um, any questions through chapter 14? Because chapter 15 starts a new section. Paula? I think it does limit to the worship assembly. I think that's the idea here, that it does limit to that. Uh, now, there, there are uh, some women even today who, you know, they don't want to speak up in class or, or make a statement in class. And, and that's, I, I think each individual needs to be guided by their conscience on that. Uh, but I think this context is about the worship assembly. And, by the way, he does say specifically in here that only two or three speak up during the worship which you said, you know, the preacher and a few other men who lead, which is exactly what Paul says. Okay. And the other one is, um, what was the purpose of speaking in tongues? What, what purpose was speaking or doing speaking in tongues? Uh, I think primarily it was communication. Uh, being able to communicate with someone that you speak a different language from. Primarily, that's the idea. But I think secondarily, and, and maybe almost as important, was the fact that this was a observable phenomenon that was outstanding. You know, pe people sat up and took notice of it. And... Uh, <clears throat> That's part of the purpose or intent of the miracles is to confirm or to follow those who were able to perform the miracle. In other words, you know, this, this guy just told me to do something I've never done before, and then he raised my mama from the dead, okay? So <laughs> that resurrection from the dead said, you ought to pay attention to this guy because there's some power in him. It worked with Jesus. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and his opening statement was what? We know that you are a teacher from God because no one can do the things that you do except God is with him. I think Nicodemus becomes a prime example for others who are seeing miracles being done, whether it's raising the dead, healing the sick, sight to the blind, or speaking in tongues. And people are taking notice of that and saying, this must be a person from God. We think of uh, Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. Uh, he had, you know, he was using the art of deception, <laughs> uh, you know, to, you know, make people think that he was some great man, right? Then along come the apostles, and they're laying hands on people, and the people they're laying their hands on are speaking in tongues and prophesying and doing all these miracles. And Simon says, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call what I was doing, but it's nothing compared to what you're doing. What will it cost for me to get that, that ability? And, of course, Peter rebukes him because he's wanting this power of the Holy Spirit. But it says that he saw that through the laying on the hands, they were, uh, uh, the gifts of the Spirit were being passed, uh, Acts 8 and 18. Uh, so there's this, uh, that, that to me would be a secondary uh, purpose of the tongues, you know, uh, and that would be to, 
confirm uh, or to uh, draw notice to the man of God. But uh, primarily, it was still it was it was to communicate. I mean, that's that's the the point. You know that. I was highlighting these, these, you know, the will speak and the speaking and the speaking and the speaking. It's all about communication, uh, prophecy and tongues. So that's, uh, that's why I was highlighting these words. What, what is said, speaking, speaker, speaker, you know, those are uh, important words. And that's, that f- fills chapter 14 uh, from beginning to end. So that, that would be my quick answer to that. I'm... Did you have another one? I, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. So slavery in the New Testament. Uh, was regulated. You, you ever wonder why Jesus didn't come in and say, you know, get rid of all your slaves? You know, why did Jesus not come in with an in- Emancipation Act immediately? I, I would say the idea of, of ownership of people and treating other people as, as cattle and property is contrary to such things as uh, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, love your neighbor as yourself. Is it love your neighbor as yourself unless they're a slave? You know, you know those. Now, slavery as an institution was much different in the in the ancient times than it was, say, during you know antebellum slavery in the United States, which was very harsh and and oppressive and, and things like that. Ancient slavery wasn't anything like that. Uh, number one, it had nothing to do with race. Uh, it, it was all about your circumstance in life. You know, if you were an indentured servant, it's because you had debt. If you were a criminal, you could work off your uh, crime through serving in other families. Uh, slaves often married into the family, would marry the next generation. I mean, they, they were treated differently, but still slavery. Imagine if the emancipation, you know, came, you know, as soon as Jesus started, said, you know, we're going we're to cut all slavery out immediately. Then all of these slaves that have a home and food on the table because they're taken care of by their patrons and masters are turned out on the street. Instant poverty. They have no job. They have no home. They have no resources. He didn't do that. So what, what did Jesus do? He set up these regulations, and I think through Paul's writings, he sets up these regulations, and, and a lot of people look at that and they say, that's, that's a trajectory. And they even call it trajectory the- theology. That right here, slavery is, is, is you know, part of the church because the church, remember Christianity started during a time when slavery was already an institution that was well known and leaned upon by society. So, but there was a trajectory that eventually slavery would be abolished by the principles of Christianity. And it was. You go back and listen to the abolitionists or read their speeches from the time in our country when abolition became, you know, the imperative. And it's heavily saturated with Christian principles. So that's the trajectory. So a lot of people apply that same way to women. They say, see, women were already oppressed by their society, but what you see in the Bible is this elevation of women, but that starts a trajectory which would eventually end in women preachers. That's, that's a big way in which they, they say that. Others do use the, the cultural application, you know, that Paul was just a product of his chauvinistic surroundings and the patriarchal mentality, and he's just that just is reflected in his writings. Uh, the problem is, is I don't I don't see that as a trajectory. I see that when when Christ came, women immediately are elevated to a higher status. But even in this higher status, there are limitations. And so I, I think that's 
that, that, that becomes the, the norm, that higher status. Uh, and then we, as a society today, we think that we've elevated women now up here, and to go to the Bible then would be to lower. You know, so it was here, the Bible puts them here, and now our modern society puts them here. Um, and then they equate value with, uh, with role. And, and that really, to me, is the biggest issue, uh, is equating value with roles. Different roles does not mean different value. Uh, they're all valuable, and we all have valuable roles. All right, there's no reason to get into Chapter 15. Any other questions? I, I, what was yours? Uh, well, I was just telling you, uh, a couple of times, you were talking about slavery. That happened in the, in the United States, and slaves were free. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but worship in the first century wasn't like we worship today. I mean, there was at least one free preacher. I mean, because they were speaking up at different times. Yes. And and I, I think it, it still applies today. I'm not saying it doesn't, but uh, that would just would, would add to the confusion the more people you have ask, asking questions. And so it says, don't ask them in the assembly, but go home and ask your husband and let him explain. And I think that also shows authority of the husband in the religious groups. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, first century worship was going to be different than the way we do it today. Uh, only in the sense that, uh, you know, they didn't have rows of pews like we have. You know, it's in, in the outward appearance of it. But I would say, you know, they prayed much the same way we prayed. They, they sang, much, and, you know, and, and, you know, after Acts chapter 8, when Philip is taken away from the Ethiopian eunuch, the next time we see him, he's the preacher in Caesarea Philippi. And so he's preaching, it appears to be on a fairly regular basis there, uh, well, Acts 20. Was, uh, I think they were interrupted as well. Yeah, because, uh, maybe, mean, yeah. I mean, because they mm. said, if you have a, you know, a revelation, the other person can stop and let yeah. you go ahead yeah. and things like that. It just can be. And I'm not saying that that what we're doing today is wrong, but I'm yeah. just saying that they just did it in a different way. Yeah. I think, anyway. Obviously, there's going to be differences, too, because we don't have the miraculous situation that they had. But even then, you well, know, there, there are differences. Have, And I would say the miracles probably didn't die out until the end of the first century, maybe even as late as the beginning of the second century, depending on how someone was when they received the laying on of hands. All right. Ron, did you? Uh, yeah. uh, Diane, go ahead. Yes. I think so. Well, it's thinking in terms of how I would feel as far as mm -hmm. worship. I do have some distinction. I can't even understand how a woman could be literal in the first century because that was a gesture that occurred to the men. I mean, what? Are you correcting me? So how would they? I'm not taking No, because uh, in, in, in chapter 11, uh, he talks about the women having a, prophesy, or a prophecy to speak. Uh, which would itself be a gift as well. And so I, I wouldn't say the gifts themselves were limited to men, uh, that, that, that women also had the opportunity to have some of these gifts. Well, some commentaries, I think even Paul say that that's, he's talking about women being speaking gifts. Yeah. I don't agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I don't either. I think that, that <coughs> I think the principle goes beyond tongues and prophesying. I think the application in the immediate context is that, but I think the principle goes beyond. Uh, real fast, Terry, go ahead. I just want to say God is trying to send a message that um, there's certain things expected of certain people in church, and God brings about peace and orderliness. And he, yeah. He, he gives people examples of 
Let the frustration put in him too. Yeah, I, I think that's right, and that's that's how he is. Uh, you know, verse thirty three. He's <coughs> he he's not a god of confusion, uh, and that's why things should be done decently and order. All right, that's uh, that ends our class. I know we're out of time, I, and that that we may have to finish this sometime before the end of January, because. Uh, that's okay. You know, I would rather finish in January than not have interruptions. So uh, let's pray together uh, as we close tonight. Father, our, our spirits are, are enlivened because of the word that you've given to us. We're so thankful for this study that we have and that, that we can share these ideas and that we can grow because of our, our sharing these, these ideas. And Father, we are so mindful of those who are sick and, and, and uh, have, are struggling right now with their health or with the passing of loved ones. Uh, uh, especially right now, thinking of Eleanor Jatko and going to the hospital, we pray that she'll receive a good report uh, and that, that things will go well for her. We also pray for uh, Baron Bishop and, and for Florence Price and for John and Picone and the Wellsbys and, and, and especially uh, uh, Christina Martinez at the loss of her mother. Father, we are, are so blessed to be called your children because we know that we have that title because you love us and you want us. Father, may we live in a way seek to live in a way that pleases you and brings you much joy in this life. In Christ's name we pray, amen.